Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to our October board meeting. The first item on the agenda will be the welcome parent prayer and the pledge. And uh, everybody, please stand. Ms. Dr. Stiles. Allow me, allow me to pray. Gracious God, thank you tonight for everyone who is represented and for, you, for the unique and special roles which they fill. We thank you for their advocacy and for their voices and for their presence in our midst. Thank you for bringing each of us here safely and providing us with a measure of good health so that we may advocate for our students, teachers, faculty, staff, and our school families. Grant us hearing ears and open hearts that we may best advocate and serve. Moreover, we pray that you provide this board with the wisdom, discernment, and fortitude that is needed to stand strongly on what is right in the best and in the best interest of our students. May we all lead in such a way that our students will thrive and prosper in their school experiences, and that one day upon graduation, they will continue to embrace learning opportunities and will assume the roles of leadership in our community, continuing to make Greenville County Schools and Greenville County a wonderful place to live, serve, and raise a family. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. And our prayer will be, we have some very special guests. Ms. Doolin, you'll introduce those. Mm -hmm. Tonight we're, we welcome Caleb and Keelan Sayers, twin fifth grade students at Bells Crossing Elementary. Both boys are honor roll students and belong to a coding ninja group where they are learning to write computer code. Keelan has been selected as Bell Crossing's, Bell's Crossing super leader for the first quarter and outside of school, Caleb plays soccer while Keelan runs track. Both boys are role models to the students at Bell's Crossing. And they lead by example with their character and worth ethic. They were brought by both their mom and dad tonight, so congratulations to them too. Would you boys please lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all very much. Uh, the next item, we have a special presentation. Ms. Goodwin Caldwell, go down there. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm here to introduce um, the um, church that is close to my heart for Cherrydale Elementary School um, that I was at while I was uh, working for the school district. Um, the Board of Trustees of Greenville County Schools nominated Mount Calvary Baptist Church for the South Carolina School Boards Association Champion for Public Education award in recognition of the congregation's long-term commitment um, and outstanding service to the children and families of Cherrydale Elementary School. They have been doing release time and been partnership with Cherrydale Elementary since 2003-04, where they did release time after school program. Tonight, we are honored to have several individuals with us from Mount Calvary Baptist. Um, please stand and be recognized when I call your name. Pastor Eric Newton, Anna Cornelius, daughter of former Pastor Robert Vincent, who spearheaded this program for many years. He was the catalyst, him and Miss Black, created this program at Cherrydale Elementary where that it addressed the needs of our population over at Cherrydale. T.J. Cornelius, 
Royce Franklin, and Esther Neal. We also have with us tonight Cherry Dale's current principal, Mrs. Deborah Johnson. Uh, do we have anybody else that's representing the school or the church from Cherry Dale? Um, I will now welcome Cheryl Burgess, who is the president of the South Carolina School Boards Association, who has traveled to be with us tonight to present this award. Cheryl. Good evening. To Greenville County School Board Chair Roger Meek, members of the Greenville County School Board and Superintendent Dr. Burke Royster, thank you for the opportunity to make a special awards presentation on behalf of the South Carolina School Boards Association. I always enjoy visiting local districts, especially to make presentations like the one we are making tonight. As stated, I am Cheryl Burgess, and I have the privilege of serving as the president of the South Carolina School Boards Association, as well as being a member of the Lexington Three batesburg leesville School Board. At this time, I would like for Chairman Meek, SCSBA Region Director 15 Lisa Wells, and SCSBA Immediate Past President Chuck Sailors to join me down front to assist with the presentation tonight. Thank you, Mount Calvary Baptist Church, for joining us tonight. Thank you for all that you do and all your help that you've done. Thank you for your wonderful partnership with Greenville County School District. This is a partnership that displays your dedication and commitment to the success of public school education. The partnership between Mount Calvary Baptist Church and the school district serves as a model for other school districts and is why the South Carolina School Boards Association is proud to recognize and honor you with our Champions for Public Education Award. The Champions for Public Education Award is presented to businesses, nonprofit organizations, and individuals who greatly support public schools. The Greenville County Board nominated you for this award because of your church's tremendous support of students in the district. Mount Calvary Baptist Church and its members give time, dedication, and resources to ensure that Greenville Public School students are prepared for learning. So we want you to know that your work does not go unnoticed. Let me tell you a little bit more about this great partnership. The ongoing partnership between Mount Calvary Baptist Church and Cherrydale Elementary serves as a model for deeply embedded, committed organizational support of a school and a community. Mount Calvary Baptist Church has partnered with Cherrydale Elementary School to serve students and families since 2004. They began with a weekly release time program which was from the start different from most programs of that type. Students were released only a few minutes prior to the end of the school day, thereby providing after school care, and the program has always included a strong tutoring component staffed by church volunteers. Over the years, the congregation has grown their involvement with the students, staff, and families of this Title I school, providing time, resources and support both during the school day and evening family programs at a school where most students live in poverty and more than half are english language learners there are significant obstacles to parent involvement by filling in the gaps in the words of principal deborah johnson mount calvary's involvement supports the volunteer base and builds relationships that make parents more comfortable to come into the school. The 17-year partnership has impacted thousands of students and families while enriching the lives of its donors and volunteers. 
On behalf of the South Carolina School Boards Association, I want you to know how much your efforts are appreciated. You are making a difference in the lives of the Greenville County students. Thank you for being a true champion for public education and congratulations. Thank you. Ms. Leventis Wales, you have a special recognition? Sure. I have a scout back in the corner. I'd like for him to stand up and tell us who he represents from jail and jail man, right? There you go. Okay. Great, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. And also uh, CEO of Public Education, Catherine Schumacher, if you would please stand up. Want everybody to see you? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Beaton. Thank you, Ms. Wells. The next item on the agenda is 4.01, it's appearance of visitors. I'd like to welcome those who have signed up to speak tonight before the Board of Trustees and thank you for your interest in Greenville County Schools. Before we begin, I will ask the Board Secretary to remind each speaker of the procedures we expect all guests to abide by tonight. Dr. Stiles. As each speaker's name is called, he or she should proceed to the podium at the end of the Board dais where there's a microphone and light system. Each speaker has up to three minutes to speak to the Board. The light system will be green for the first two minutes and will turn yellow when one minute remains on the speaker's allotted time. In keeping with board policy, KCA, abusive language or personal attacks aimed at students or staff members will not be permitted. All speakers are expected to behave in an orderly and respectful manner. The board will not engage in discussion with the speaker or respond to, to comments. The superintendent will designate a member of the staff to respond to each speaker in an appropriate and timely manner. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stiles. Our first speaker is Hagen Rogers. When the murder rate spikes by 48% in Chicago and Mayor Lori Lightfoot, her solution is to defund the police the country has gone mad. When the Attorney General labels concerned fathers like me a domestic terrorist, the country has gone mad. Let me be clear. I know who I am. I am an American, a father, and not a domestic terrorist. What is all of this? Unfortunately, I can say with certainty, this is a Marxist revolution. Let me share a quote from the 1930s by an Italian communist named Antonio Gramsci. 
defining what they need to do to take over a Judeo-Christian nation. Gramsci said, any country grounded in Judeo-Christian values cannot be overthrown until those roots are cut. Socialism is precisely the religion that must overwhelm Christianity. In the new order, socialists will triumph by first capturing the culture by infiltration of the schools, universities, churches, and media, and by transforming the consciousness of a society. My children are zoned for Oakview Elementary, but they don't attend Oakview Elementary. Why, you may ask? Oakview recently implemented Social Emotional Learning, SEL. What is SEL? It is a form of critical race theory. In 2020, SEL's curriculum was updated to teach America's precious children about social justice, questioning sexual identity and sexual orientation, police brutality, colorism, whiteism, and white privilege. Terms riddled throughout SEL's program are in fact in violation of the Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. To quote the Oakview Action Plan here, in the school year, Oakview instituted a new committee focused on SEL. SEL continues to be our focus here at Oakview. SEL has become a priority in all areas of Oakview and the SEL program components are promoted daily throughout our building. To be clear why I'm here, SEL is critical race theory taught in the elementary school level to our children in Greenville, South Carolina. CRT is a Marxist ideology. Marxism is the opposite of the American way and you know it. What do we do now? We pull our children out of a burning building. The public school system is burning right now. No parent leaves their child in a burning building. And to you, Greenville County, Greenville County School Board, you must stop this fire and restore the building. Only then might we consider trusting you with our children. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. <laughs> Our next speaker, Mary Ann Coleman. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. It says it right there. She's number six. He's number two. Two and six switch places. I see that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. First word I'd like to say is wow. Wow being, I'm surprised. Uh, this is the first time I've ever been to this meeting. Wow being, I'm blown away by the way the meeting started with prayer and a pledge of allegiance to the flag. And I would say I would love to have that see that happen in every one of our schools across Greenville County, across our great nation. Humbly, I believe that we could trace back the issues we're having across our country to when prayer was removed from school. So if we can do it here, why can't we do it in school? So that's off my script, but that's one thing. So, uh, my name is Mike Brown. My wife is here with me, Shay Brown. Ladies here. and gentlemen, don't take time from while he's speaking. Thank you. We are from South Carolina. We own our own business, which is in real estate. Uh, and guys, folks are moving here, as you know, from not only around the country, but from around the world. And they're moving here because of who we are and what we stand for, including what has been or been taught in our schools. So we have a beautiful blended family with four children, a 24-year-old, 22-year-old, and 21-year-old that all graduated from Greenville County Schools, and a 14-year-old a locally adopted son who up until this past year was in Greenville County Schools, but he's now being homeschooled via the Becca program as an eighth, gra eighth grader. I'll get to why we pulled him out shortly. Uh, guys, we're living in some crazy times, some uncertain times that history and our Heavenly Father will judge. We're living in a time that many around the world and our great nation have lost faith in its so-called leaders, its so-called scientists, its so-called media, and leaving us all with questions of what the heck is truly going on. What is truly going on because it's just not adding up. A Greenville Camp County native by the name of Aaron Tempen had a popular song that stated, you've got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. You've got to be your own man, not a puppet on a string. 
Never compromise what's right. Uphold your family name. You've got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. So as we of Greenville County, the school board, the schools, are we standing for what's right? Are we falling for anything? As we turn on our TVs, indoor, outdoor events, they have no mask. And our so-called leaders that are there uh, are not wearing them, but those serving them are. What's the use in these masks? We're witnessing these mandates for the vaccine from the highest office in our land, and yet Congress is not required to take that vaccine. Our U.S. Post Office is not required to take that vaccine, and many others are not. But we have wit and we've witnessed 1.7 million people cross our southern border without a vaccine, without a test, and God only knows where those people are in our nation right now. Some could be right here in Greenville County. So if we can just take out the political science of what's going on and get down to the real science, we might find a way to get to what's really going on and fix the problem. Um, is that my time? Well, good luck, God bless, and God bless America. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Our next speaker is Mary Ann Coleman. When Attorney General Merrick Garland's controversial memo became public, I contacted Chairman Meeks by email and he responded, who are you? I am Judith Tanzola, a taxpayer and concerned citizen. But because I questioned the memo, he asked, do you condone violence? No, sir, let the record show, I certainly do not condone violence. Since last month's board meeting, it, is, it has been a detestable time for the country, South Carolina, and even those of us in Greenville. Though there's 500 miles between 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and East Camperdown Way, we still felt the effects of Biden's administration's desperate decisions. A game of hot potato was played between the White House, the Liberal National School Board Association, and Attorney General Garland, each one tossing the issues to the other the other way, and it was a three-way tie. They were all losers. Biden lost because we the people continue to pick up on his desire to control us with masks and mandates, etc. The NSBA was caught in a lie which resulted in losing state members and money. And yes, they apologized. But according to Dr. Carol Swain, it was a hollow apology because they got caught. Remember the mantra, always follow the money. Our republic and its very existence is in grave danger. But why wouldn't government and school officials work to stop that? Why does this school district and others across the country insist on including social emotional learning, an offshoot of CRT, when parents do not want their children associated with it? What is it? Is it, is it in spite? Is it a power struggle? Is, is it the absolute best curriculum we can offer our kids? No, it's not. We can do better here in Greenville. It's a way for liberal publishing houses to make millions just ask Merrick Garland's son-in-law. He knows what his wallet is full of. I am concerned that Dr. Martin Luther King's dream is becoming a present-day nightmare. He hoped his four little children would live in a nation where they would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, and this might be lost forever. Here's a photo of two uh, four-year-old boys, one white, one black with hands clasped because they are buddies and don't want to lose each other, oblivious to the future world around them that will try with the sharpened arrow of CRT to separate them. But we parents and tech taxpayers won't let that happen, and neither should you. As a school board, please realize opposing the wish Thank you, Ms. Coleman. and taxpayers is like a pencil with two erasers, no point. Mm -hmm. Next speaker is Judith Tanzola. That was her. Hold on a minute. They changed their numbers. Okay, let's try uh, Kathleen Griffith. Not, definitely not as prepared as, as you all. I did move from Rhode Island here in 2019, so I'm new to the area. This is my first school board meeting. 
I'm really thankful to be here uh, exercising my First Amendment right, actually four of them, uh, the right of religion, the freedom of religion, uh, with that lovely prayer, um, freedom of speech, I'm talking to you all, which is wonderful, uh, freedom to assemble with all of you all, and most importantly, freedom to petition. And did you know about three years ago, I couldn't have told you that those were four of the rights in our First Amendment? I couldn't have told you that. And there's one missing. Does anyone know what that fifth one is? Freedom of the press. This is an example of why I'm actually here. Um, so I'm actually here to petition for better and more civics education. Um, John Jay, our first Chief Justice to the Supreme Court, taught uh, or, or spoke these words, every member of the state ought diligently to read and to study the Constitution of his country and teach the rising generation to be free. By knowing their right, they will soon perceive when they are violated and be the better prepared to defend and assert them. I think if we took a moment to test ourselves here, this is the school board, right? I think we might learn and agree that we're failing in this area. Um, so uh, I'm guilty. I'm going to tell you right now, I found history really boring. I remembering names and dates and events. It was really boring. And when I grew up, I'm in my 50s, there was really no character to our founding fathers. It was really sort of blasé, right? They're a bunch of guys, right? They fought some wars and we're free and isn't it great? But I didn't really understand the character. So today I'm self-correcting. I am teaching myself the history and as I'm doing that, I'm sharing it with others. I actually am a software developer. It was awesome to see those little boys here who are doing software development. Um, I do that to, that's my living. Um, but I actually volunteer and I teach um, the Constitution. I am a Constitution coach and it's completely free. Um, and I do that because I'm very passionate about sharing this information. And so I encourage our school board to look to bring this back in. So in closing, I guess what I want to say, and, and I couldn't even said it better than Mr. Brown earlier, opening with prayer, opening with a Pledge of Allegiance, we need that back in our school systems. We can't be a civil society if we don't have a moral society, and so that's really important. But I will close with this. Um, we hold these truths to be self-evident. These are words of Thomas Jefferson. He's actually the author of our Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, regardless of skin, gender, regardless of where they came from. Uh, they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Thank you, Ms. Griffin. In closing, to secure these Thank rights, you, Ms. Griffin. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Griffin. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, Mary Ann Coleman, come speak or not speak tonight. Lynn Brown. No, Lynn Brown's. No, Mary Ann Coleman. Trained numbers. Ms. Coleman, speak or not? Are you Ms. Coleman? Yes, but I'm not going to speak. You changed the number. We don't change the number. You speak now or you not speak? I'll just go now. Thank you. How do you do? I was here a couple months ago. I'm a grandmother, Mary Ann Coleman, have six grandkids in the Greenville County Schools. In recent days, one hundreds of hundreds of police officers and medical professionals have either resigned or been fired due to their refusal to get the job. Many other police departments are fighting back, filing lawsuits and also staging sick outs. Last week in Greenville and around the country, GE workers staged a walkout protesting vaccine mandates. I was happy to be standing with them. What is it about the virus and the vaccine that the medical profession is not telling us? The number of vaccinated Americans, vaccinated Americans, are being infected with the virus that they are duplicating, and they are the majority of the hospitalized patients. Number two, five days after a 17-year-old got the second dose of Pfizer vaccine, experienced fever, vomiting, myalgia, and chest pain. 
a 12-year-old child died after a Pfizer vax. So back in 1976, the swine flu vaccination campaign, there was a committee who reported to Americans referencing the safety of the vaccines. After the emergence of 25 deaths and 550 cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome, the government shut down the vaccine. That was 76. This isn't the case now in this country even though 17,000 plus deaths reported after the COVID jab. So my concern tonight is the contact tracing going on in our school system. The vaccinated do not have to isolate as long as an unvaccinated child. When a child is indicated as being three to six feet in proximity to a child that is infected, that child or children have to be quarantined. Then a committee assigned to the case decides the amount of time needed in isolation at home. My grandson missed 10 days with no signs or symptoms of a virus. The tests that are recommended cannot isolate the COVID-19 genome but it can determine if there's a coronavirus present or as it's known as the common cold. This is why there are so many false positives. So a child is segregated from teachers, friends, learning experiences based on a faulty test. I honestly believe you're encouraging parents to vaccinate their children so they don't have to disrupt their classroom time. As I said before, the majority of people in hospitals today are the vaccinated. Please do the right thing. Don't waste time on convincing yourselves that you can predict the Thank you, Ms. Bur Thank you, Ms. Coleman. virus. Thank well, you, Ms. Coleman. Concentrate on the education. Thank you, Ms. Coleman. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Lynn Brown. Thank you for me, allowing me to speak. I'd like to start with James 4:17. Therefore, to one that knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. Dr. Bryson, MD, a world-renowned neurologist from Germany, warned that face masks cause oxygen deprivation and permanent neurolog neurological damage, especially in the developing brains of children. Nerve cells in the hippocampus part of the brain that cannot survive longer than three minutes without oxygen. The acute warning symptoms are headaches, drowsiness, dizziness, issues in concentration, slowing down of reaction time, reactions of cognitive system. The symptoms disappear if oxygen deprivation is chronic, but the damage continues. The second problem is that the nerve cells in the brain are unable to divide themselves normally and will no longer be regenerated. What is gone is gone. She says that to deprive a child, a, a child's or an adolescent's brain from oxygen or to restrict it in any way is not only dangerous to their health, it is absolutely criminal as the damage is permanent. Oxygen deprivation can also induce early onset dementia. A physician who treated the president speaks out. I risk my life, my career, my family, my, my reputation to sit here and tell you what I'm telling you. To follow the advice of these global leaders, the death rates will be over 2 billion people. This is a level of malevolence that we have not seen in the history of humanity. And these are the people who do not have to get the, the vaccine, the jab. It's not an actual vaccine. And this is the most recent VAERS data that these numbers have gone up from 10-1 to 1026. And this only represents 10% of the actual people who have been injured by this jab. If you have gotten the jab, you can no longer give plasma. If you, um, only if you have the um, antibodies. Now I would like to close with a little story as to why, and this is why I gave the, the verse at the beginning. I lived in Germany during the Nazi Holocaust. I considered myself a Christian. We had heard the stories of what was happening to the Jews, but like most people today in this country, we tried to distance ourselves from the reality of what was really taking place. A railroad track ran behind our small church. We became disturbed one Sunday when we noticed cries coming from the train as it passed by. We grimly realized that the train was carrying Jews. Week after week, that train whistle would blow. The Jews would begin to cry out to us as they passed our church. It was so terribly disturbing. We could do nothing to help those poor, miserable people, yet their screams tormented us. 
By the time that train came rumbling past the churchyard, we were singing at the top of our voices. Now, as many years later, I see it happening all over again in America. The response is the same as it was in my country. Silence. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Our next speaker is Dakota Fitzgerald. All right, thank you guys for having me. Um, before I get started, I'd like to take a moment to address all of the parents here. Each and every one of you should take a moment to pat yourselves on the back. Your unrelenting bravery <laughs> has become an inspiration to parents across the country and you all are making a difference. You are the solution. Thank you for standing strong in the face of adversity, for bearing the title of domestic terrorists, because you were brave enough to stand up for your children and for not backing down or being deterred when faced with government overreach or threats of intimidation. May you continue to put on the full armor of God and trust that when God is with you, no one can be against you. I'm here to discuss difficult truths with you all today and to address the repercussions of the COVID-19 vaccine response via masking and quarantining on our children. Before we do this, let's take a minute to understand that what I'm about to speak on can be difficult to hear, but those with ears to hear will be empowered with truth and knowledge and will be better prepared to protect themselves and those they love. Human trafficking is the fastest growing crime in the United States. Greenville County is ranked third in the state for human trafficking and unfortunately is ranked number one in the nation for familial sex trafficking. Studies show that the COVID-19 pandemic has increased the demand for trafficking, child sexual exploitation materials, and has negatively impacted our ability to respond to the very real and much more pressing humanitarian crisis. Predators have no respect for the rule of law. While law-abiding citizens and parents are being forced to follow illogical rules, child predators exploit the situation and do everything they can to maximize their profit. While hardworking families are plunged into financial crisis, commercial, or excuse me, uh, traffickers seize the opportunity to exploit children through forced labor, commercial sex acts, and forced criminality. These predators are not ignorant people. They understand that children being forced to take online school would be more exposed to internet activity. These predators understand that a child being quarantined and locked down is more apt to engage in online conversation, which can quickly lead to grooming and turning out of young individuals. 37% of stakeholder surveys reported that human trafficking recruitment efforts moved to online platforms during the pandemic. Furthermore, the masking of individuals has made it exponentially more difficult to identify a trafficking victim or their trafficker. What is the first thing a predator does when they kidnap a child? They cover their faces. They take away their smiles. I'm extremely disappointed that in the last two years, we have enabled these heinous acts and made the trafficker's job that much easier in the name of safety. I hope you all see the irony in that statement. We're done standing idly by. We're done being quiet. And we're done allowing the government to tell us that we have to place our children in extreme circumstances for a virus with a 99% survival rate. That stops here and now. We will not continue to empower sick Thank you, Ms. Fitzgerald. On the most innocent of our population. Thank you, Ms. Fitzgerald. And we will not continue Thank you, Ms. Fitzgerald. Ms. Fitzgerald. Ms. Fitzgerald. <laughs> Hold on just a sec, Ms. Fitzgerald, are you finished or you want to take it outside? I'm finished right now. I'm like, so, okay, sit down, please. No, that's not. Ms. Fitzgerald, will you please leave? Please leave. Ms. Fitzgerald, thank you. Our next speaker is Mark Roberts. That one, oh, that one is tough to follow. I have three lovely daughters. Um, 
But thank you for the opening prayer. That was encouraging. I appreciate that. Um, so let me start by saying, but because you've not taken action on your COVID contact tracing policy, I'm not convinced that the science behind it has any influence on your compliance with DHEC. I could tell you again tonight about many new studies showing that contact tracing does little to nothing to prevent the spread. I could remind you that of the over 16,000 students in Greenville County who have quarantined since the start of school year as of October 12th, only 359 may have been exposed to school. That's less than 2%, and many of these kids would have been out anyway because of symptoms. You have 166,000 lost days of school. For what? The assertion that DHEC has statutory authority to make you follow their contact tracing policy has no backing in the law. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about the law as it might relate to contact tracing. Regulation 61-20, Section 2 states that medical providers must report known or suspected cases to DHEC. Section 3 says DHEC must investigate these. Section 4 states that DHEC has the responsibility to direct methods of control, including isolation and quarantine. Section 5, that DHEC is to manage quarantine. Section 11 states that it's DHEC's duty to determine who is a threat by infection or being exposed. Section 12 states that school administrators shall not permit students from having any communicable diseases on the exclusion list to extend school, or to attend school, excuse me. So DHEC has the authority to advise muni municipal authorities per 44-1-90 and direct local boards of health per 44-1-170, but there's no authority to direct school administrators. The school is only required to follow the exclusion list, not to investigate positive cases, not to investigate close contact or manage quarantine. That is the lawful duty of DHEC. So please stop using our taxpayer money that is meant for education on contact tracing. So SC law 59-20-30 states it's the purpose of the General Assembly to guarantee each student has the availability of at least a minimum education um, to their needs and that to ensure that the taxpayer dollars are spent on all children. If you tell me that you have to follow their guidance per law 44-1-140, which says DHEC may make and enforce rules for the care and segregation and isolation, I'll direct you to law 44-1-70, which says all rules promulgated by the board shall be null and void unless they're approved by the General Assembly, and they haven't been approved by the General Assembly. Law 44-29-200, any board may have prohibit attendance. The second sentence says the decision to prohibit attendance must be based on sound medical evidence and must comply with the official policy. The word and means that both conditions must apply. Last time I shared with you, there's not sound medical evidence. But what is the official policy? If, if you direct to DHEC's guidance, as I just pointed out, it's not, it's not relevant. So please stop contact tracing. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. One more person just introduced. schools. Hey, Ms. Leventus Wales, you have another recognition. Yes, uh, Kim Mahaffey with Communities and Schools. Um, if you would just stand. Um, we have our board liaison, Angie Mosley, who is on this board. And I just wanted to say that Communities and Schools does so much for Greenville County Schools children, students. Thank you so much, Kim. Thank you, Ms. Leventus Wales. <laughs> Our next item on the agenda is 6.0, no, excuse me, 5.01 superintendent's report. Mr. Mayor. Dr. Royster. Let's get the adoption of it. Can we do? Yeah. Oh, do I have to do that too? <laughs> uh, next item on the agenda, let's do that then. Uh, 4.01, nope, we got that. Uh, number three, uh, adoption of the consent calendar is there a motion to approve I have a motion in a second any discussion hearing none all in favor of the motion say aye aye all opposed say no motion carries now let's go to 5.01 dr royster uh, thank you mr meek uh, just briefly uh, in lieu of a formal superintendent's report tonight uh, one announcement but uh we spent uh, as you all will recall about an hour and a half, two hours, going over the testing information in a workshop before the meeting. So that will serve in, in place of a formal superintendent's report. I do want to announce that we set a new record uh, for scholarship uh, 
funds generated at our golf tournament this year, $48,500, which will uh, go directly to scholarships for graduating seniors, uh, split one half among the, uh, the family of employees and one half to students in general. So thank you and thanks to those who participated and made that a success. Thank you, Dr. Royster. Next item on the agenda is 6.01, Appeal of the Materials Review Committee Decisions. Dr. Royster. Mr. Meek, we have no uh, new information to present. Uh, Dr. McDavid uh, did a presentation on that at the Committee of the Whole. Uh, we certainly would uh, respond to any questions the board might have. I believe you may need a motion to be on the floor first prior to that, though. We have no presentation. Thank you, Dr. Royster. The, uh, there was four different books that the board was asked to review. There are four different recommendations from the administration. Do I hear a motion? Ms. Bush. I move to uphold the decision of the High School Materials Review Committee regarding the appropriateness of the book Dark Money. We have, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on this motion? Ms. Dr. Stiles, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, thank you. I did have a question um, that was addressed at the Committee of the Whole, and I just wanted to see if there was any updates. There was some discussion uh, in regard to a lack of balance in regard to the books that were on the reading list, and I just wanted to ask um, if there's been any updates about that. You know, I, I think kind of the broader answer to that uh, question or inquiry, and we mentioned this at the Committee of the Whole, Mr. McCoy and his staff have worked on putting together a process to select books or titles for reading list. Uh, that process is being circulated out to principals for their comment and input. Uh, kind of the summary of that process would be that uh, departments within a school would work together to develop lists. Uh, with it then be approved by that principal. Now they certainly could share lists between schools, but the process in for the last number of years, it's really simply been left to each individual teacher at the school uh, and subject level. Uh, and so they were doing, in many cases, individual lists. There was some collaboration, but wasn't required. This will result in an overall list for a department developed by the teachers. We think it's extremely important that teachers uh, use their professional knowledge and expertise in making selections for reading materials and it will go through that process and and the principal will oversee that and ensure that it meets the requirements of our policy and our rule uh, hopefully that answers your question yes thank you so very much yes ma'am thank you dr styles miss mosley thank you mr meek um to kind of go along with carolyn's question I think the concern about balance is there, but my other question is going forward, are, what attempts are we gonna to make to be a little more transparent with our reading list? I feel like that is something that I'm hearing from a lot of parents and not just with our this particular appeal, but just with our curriculum in general. So are, are we going to be publishing this list to make it accessible? All our, all our reading lists, uh, I believe Mr. McCoy, are now published on the teacher's individual website as part of the syllabus to their course. Okay, so then let me just make sure I understood you correctly with your what you were just explaining to Dr. Stiles. Um, so there's been a more collaborative effort to, to put together a reading list. There will be. There that, will be. That process is in, the, is in being developed It'll be implemented uh, within the next month. Okay, so then should we see more consistency? Will it be the same reading list for across the district? Like in this case, it's high school AP, I believe. So will that be the it'll same be the list same, for every? It'll be the same through a school. It might not be exactly the same throughout the district. Okay. But the schools will share all their list with the other schools. Okay, and then so last question, are we we the are we gonna get an update on this or like when it rolls out officially and Yeah, because well, I think we'll likely roll it out in administrative rules so you'll receive an update to, to our rule for that purpose. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have mm -hmm. for now. Thank you. 
Any further questions? Ms. LaVentis Wells. Yes, thank you, Mr. Meek. So, Dr. Royster um, and Ms. Mr. McCoy, questions for you two. It, it, was it my understanding that years ago, um, SAT or ACT put out a list, and that was the list that the Greenville County School District used? Uh, College Board used to uh, Board. provide a list for AP courses. Now, obviously, that wouldn't be for some other courses, but for AP courses, and they discontinued that four or five years ago, think, yeah, it was some, some number of years ago they discontinued. That was the list that was consistent throughout the district, for is that the, correct? You, you for could, the APs, yes. you, you could add to it, but yes, and, and in fact, it would have been fairly consistent with AP courses throughout the country. Okay, good. So my question is, why would we not have a list that would be consistently used throughout all of our 14 high school, well, 15 high schools now, where every every high school would have basically the same list of uh, books for the students to to pick from. Because I, I'm just going to be honest with you, I did talk to a group of students, and you know the the list of books are fine. Um, you know, there's controversy in everything, but there's controversy in everything we do today and in the past. And so they're going to have to, you know, according to the way the teacher presents it, it's good if I may not agree with Ms. Doolin, but she understands my point of view and I understand her point of view, but we're not led to believe one point of view. We have our own and we can speak freely about it because that's what we prepare our students for in life. You're going to have choices. You make choices on decisions. You, you do your research, you figure it out, and so forth. And I think that goes directly to the method in which things are presented. And it goes back to complying with the policy that we have about how you present <coughs> controversial subjects, which should be presented in the manner that you just described. Right. That you're and not. We, we have one belief, you're giving an opportunity to establish. Uh, but we have, at this point, have stuck with schools developing their own because our, our communities are very different. We are a, a, a county-wide school system, but our schools serve very different communities. We want the school to still be able to reflect the local community, to be able to reflect the input from the teachers in that building. Now, if we find that doesn't work and it doesn't handle things effectively, then we could go to a more restrictive approach because if we do a district-wide list, that's a more restrictive approach. And we don't want to go to that. We don't want to start at that point. Well, all I can say to that point, Dr. Royster, is parents need to be aware of the list. Students need to be aware, but I just think if it's consistent throughout the district, then everyone knows what the books are that everyone's reading and has that opportunity to add to or take away as your department heads uh, at the um, in, in the English departments at all the high schools with AP would have that option to consolidate and add to the list for everyone to have that option of book. Maybe, maybe there's some teachers that find a book out there that think, this might be good for other schools to read. That's why we want to share that list. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Royster. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Levent, as well. Any other questions, comments? Ms. Doolin. Thank you. I just wanted to read a sentence from our board policy that says, well, let me go up. It is board policy IFA which was last revised in 2016. Uh, professional staff involved in procuring or developing instructional materials should seek to provide materials on opposing sides of controversial issues so that students may develop under guidance the practices of critical reading and thinking. I did not read cover to cover all four of these books because I really only had a week. Uh, but I did read some of each, so I got some ideas of the material included in each book. 
but there were no books of opposing sides presented. So the only evidence I have are the books that I read, and if I was a student, this would be it. So I feel like these books violate our board policy because, not because of the content that's in them, but because there's not opposing content also presented. So for that reason, I will be voting no on these books. Not that I think they should be banned, but that I think they need a partner. If they're gonna be taught in the classroom, there should be a pair. So I just wanted to explain publicly. Thank you, Ms. Newland. Any f Ms. Goodwin Caldwell. Um, yes, uh, um, thank you, Mr. Meek. Um, I did get the four books and I read them. Um, not the entire books, but there was 25 books on the list. So you don't know whether you had opposing views in those other 21 or not because you didn't read them. So um, the you always have to have, just like Linda said, you're going to have controversial issues. Um, but when have, um, what is this world coming to where that we are telling our children, we are basically telling them how to think. We used to didn't do that. We let them gain their own way. So, um, but the books, um, it, it told that person point of view, but there were 25 books that you could choose from. And these were the four that the person presented. So I, I think that when we, when we start pulling books, we are not giving that opposing viewpoint. It's okay um, to some people when their viewpoint is presented, but not the other. So um, I will be voting yes for us to um, continue having these books. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. goodwin Caldwell. Mr. Suddeth. <coughs> In looking at what we've been talking about, when I looked at, <clears throat> Excuse me, our board policy, and the board policy stated that we needed to look at the things that were supposed to help people make a decision or understand what they were doing. When I looked at what the school district said for the AP English Language in Composition course, it's supposed to be evidence-based, analytic, and argumentative writing. And it's also said, the school district provides educational value for the purpose of the course. And then it says here, those four books, they were pulled out of context. They did not align with the actual theme of the books. It seems that we're looking at opposing viewpoints. If you're going to have a view of opposing viewpoints, why does it have to be on something that divides our country? Why can't it be on something that brings our country together? If they want something controversial, then what about open versus a closed border? What about taxing the wealthy? Why does it have to be something that puts pits person against person, people against people? Uh, I hope that we can bring people together, not create divisions. I don't know why we have to have so much argumentative writing. Why can't we have some writing that brings people together? These four books don't bring people together. These four books tend to divide politically or racially. And we need to get away from that. We need to get on with doing what we're doing. I hope that in the future, that as Dr. Roster has said, that we can look at what teachers are recommending and there needs to be some kind of a limit on what a teacher can do. Or if not, then we're gonna become a country that we were, have not been for 250 years. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Suddeth. Anyone that's uh, supports and fair. 
Thank you, Ms. Meeks. Um, could someone remind me of how these four books were selected? Because I was under the opinion that the selection process, this is the result of the selection process and that students were involved in selecting those books in, according, in addition to the teachers. So they could have selected any book of opposing view on that list as opposed to these four. So could someone review how that selection process that, uh, uh, I, I, that That I think is s sort of correct. The initial list was developed by that one teacher. That was that teacher's list. There, I think there were 25 books on that list. Is that right, Dr. McDonough? You could pick any book on the list. This particular objection began when uh, I think a student didn't st uh, select a book by the deadline, if I remember correctly. And so they were assigned a book because they hadn't picked one. And they didn't wish to read that book, didn't agree with the content, didn't disagree with the viewpoint, whatever. So they were provided an opportunity to pick another one off the list and they did not want to pick one of them. Then they were provided the opportunity to suggest their own book. And I'm not sure whether that, that happened or not, but they were provided the opportunity. Uh, I think you have some material that shows that in writing. So if you, if uh, your policy that we obviously follow and make certain that our schools follow is if a student or parent has an objection to a book on a reading list, they may choose another one or they may offer a substitute. And it has to be approved by the teacher so that it carries the same uh, purpose. And the purpose here was to do analytical writing. Uh, I believe uh, if I understood the assignment correctly, you could choose to support what was written in the book or you could choose to take an opposing viewpoint. But even if you chose to support what was in the book, you were supposed to expose the flaws in the thinking as well. I believe that was my understanding. Uh, but the balance on that list has already been addressed to the principal of that school. And I don't believe, and I, I don't really think that has, this has anything to do with this assignment or not. I do not believe that teacher is teaching this course anymore. Uh, that, is that, that correct, Mr. Uh, so it So that teacher's not fulfilling this assignment. There's a reading list, obviously, for whoever the teacher is that took, the, took their place. And as I mentioned, Mr. McCoy is working on a process that all schools will follow. So it's not just a teacher picking a book. It is all the teachers in that school community working together to select titles, approved ultimately by the principal of that school. With always the understanding, you can pick any of those if it's a reading list. And there's sometimes there be, might be an assigned reading. But if it's a reading list, you can pick any on there or you can offer up a substitute. So hopefully that answers your question, Morrison Fair. Thank you, Ms. Morris Affair. Mr. Lewis. A, a couple of questions. So, so first, um, is, is the intention of the chair that we're going to take each of these books separately? Is that, yes, is that the idea? Yes, that's correct. So the specific motion that we're looking at right now is specifically on dark money and not yes, on yes, all sir. of the books that's correct. collectively. That's correct. And just to make sure I understand uh, board policy IFA, Dr. Royster, so if you could just clarify for me. So the, the policy here reads, uh, school personnel shall not require a student to use instructional materials that offend the student or his or her parents or guardian. And the parents or guardian should request in writing an alternate assignment when they find that the plan material is offensive. So is, is it our understanding that uh, the student failed to choose a book, so specifically dark money here, no, no book was chosen off the list of the 20, 25 books that there, were options. There was a deadline. The student didn't respond to make a choice by that deadline. The student was assigned a book then. Then the student and or parent objected to that book. They were offered an opportunity to select another one and ultimately to provide a title of their own choosing. And did they do that? 
I don't know. I don't know if they ever did any. They they did not pick an alternate. Did they propose another title? So they did not complete that assignment. Would that be my understanding, Dr. Dunn? Student read the book or a portion of the book that was assigned. Okay. So uh, we, we don't know, and it, and it obviously wouldn't be appropriate in, in this forum to discuss whether they grade, they received, or whatever, but th they did not take advantage of those opportunities. The, so the, the policy which provides parents the opportunity to opt out by providing a request in writing of an alternative book, the parent didn't do that during the time period of the class. Yeah, that, yes, sir, I believe that's correct. And then when the parent appealed the book to us under the question, to what age group would you recommend this material, the parent wrote, I don't have an issue with our kids reading this book. And then he lists three other books that he um, wishes would be additional selections. If, if the parent had submitted that in writing to the teacher with the three texts here, would the student have been allowed to read these books that the parent has listed here as alternatives to the one that was assigned? So the parent doesn't have a problem with these students in this district reading this book says it here in his appeal, well, I read that. Yes, right. listed books that he wished the student could have read alternatively, but didn't request that of the teacher. That's, uh, that's my understanding as well. So I, I'm not sure what we can do here if the parent can't do what was requested of them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Anybody else want to speak? It hasn't already spoke. Uh, in just a minute, let me see if that's fine. Ms. Mosley had already indicated she wants to speak first. Uh, I'm going to let everyone speak first that, that hasn't spoke. So if you want to speak, go ahead. Well, I, I guess a couple things. You know, to Mr. Lewis's point, this we're, we're deciding whether or not these books need to be removed based on a parent request, but the parent request isn't specifically saying to remove this book. So I'm struggling a little bit with how our, you know, an action to say we want the book removed. It, I mean, is that, is that, I mean, we're just saying we're gonna uphold the re committee's recommendation, but the committee is recommending the book remain. So I, I guess that just muddies the water a little bit about what kind of action we're taking here. So, you know, I guess, Mr. Chairman, you can kind of figure out what that looks like. But I guess beyond that, the thing I would say is I, I often read articles or material and interpret them and um, pull things out of them when I analyze them that if I discuss those with my husband who might have read the same article or the same body of, of literature, he might see something totally different. He might not have gotten the idea I got. So I struggle a little bit with us thinking that you know, for every book, we have to make sure that we find a book that has an, an opposing view because to Mr. Sub's point, some books may provoke thought and it may, you may have an issue that you're trying to get kids to think about so that they can debate you know, the, the merits of it, but it's not necessarily always an opposing or does it need to be. So, you know, in the conversation of what the district needs to do to balance that, I think that's a really slippery slope to try to get up and down because, you know, I might say, well, gosh, this opposing view, they did a better job with this view than this book you chose on this other view. This wasn't as good. So, yeah, I, I, what, I, what I hope we don't do is take away the ability of our trained teachers, um, you know, men and women who spent years in school and years after that, every year honing their craft to help students navigate literature and understand it and analyze it and see it for, for what it is, whether it's rhetoric or whether it's, it's fallacy. And then being able to kind of figure that out on their own. We are, we are trying to teach them how to be critical thinkers, not what to think. So. Um, you know, I just because that commentary has been offered with with in this action, I wanted to just 
kind of offer that perspective that maybe that's a, de depending on where that goes, maybe that needs to be a follow-up discussion about this policy in particular and what it says and what it, what it means to each one of us if the administration is going to then take some action based on how we're interpreting our policy. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wells. Ms. Bush, any comment? Mr. Sailors? No, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Mosley. Thank you. Sorry, I have a few more questions. Um, to clarify something Ms. Goodwin Caldwell said, Jeff, I'm going to ask this of you. Are there other books on the list of 25, I, and I'm assuming that's the right number, that are opposing views to any of these books? I would have to defer that to Dr. McDavid. For each of the areas that were listed in the challenge, there was not an, a matching opposing viewpoint. The assignments were given to students to analyze and provide documentation or provide evidence of, as Dr. Royster put it, the argument, the bias, and the flaws in thinking if they, if they supported it or did not. So the teacher's assignments were rich in the fact that students were supposed to analyze what was being presented to them, not that they would be taking it at face value. Isn't the book about the radical race? Sir, yeah. sir, yeah. sir, don't interrupt. Um, oh, y'all have to leave. Don't interrupt. Okay. So Jeff, just to be clear, and if I understood Dr. Royster earlier, we are, because of this inquiry, for lack of a better word, we are pursuing a process improvement here, as well as more transparency and just an overall just review of yeah, I think the, what's I, being offered. Yes, and I think the, and certainly not everything, as is, is Ms. Wells pointed out, not everything is going to have an opposing right. viewpoint, certainly. Right. There's many lists that have no necessarily an opposing viewpoint. Yeah. But certainly on certain topics, you do, I think, want to present a both sides um, when that's applicable, when that's reasonable to do so in those cases. I think the um, process will put more of eyes, particularly on the materials. I mean, I think it's always good for a department to have some consistency. Um, and that those folks, there's been a uh, review or a vetting process with that. Um, up until this point, while well, the policy doesn't outline that, up until this point, the policy outlines the selection criteria, but not necessarily, you know, the, the department needs to agree on that or three people or six people. Okay. so. And I'm kind of with Lisa on this, as, just as far as my confusion. You kind of asked my question. I, this is our first materials review, so I'm looking at these documents for the first time, or at least I did at the Cal. Um, it appears, and make, make sure I'm not misunderstanding, there are three options that a parent can ask of. It, one of them is do not assign it to the child, withdraw it from all students at the grade level, and then send to the district's material review committee for reevaluation. And it appears, based on what, because I was looking through this earlier today, that going back to the parent's original complaint, that his complaint was more about the lack of balance and less about, I mean, even though he was concerned about some of the content in the books, and I have to be honest with you as a, as a mom, and as board member too, I, I have concerns about some of the content too for no other reason than I believe with the millions of books that exist in this world that we could teach critical or teach or I should say enhance or support critical thinking skills without vulgarity in our children's reading as well as uh, I guess other topics that are a little bit more offensive or could be offensive to certain religious groups and some other things but I'm, I'm not going to argue with the fact that we can't protect our children from everything and we certainly do want critical thinkers and we certainly do want to challenge our students to to look at things that might be uncomfortable or, or whatever you know I think that improves their thinking skills however um, I just want to get back to the original complaint which what sounded more like looking at the process, looking at the way we choose our books, looking at making sure there's balance, less bias, whatever you want to take it. it, it so I'm a little bit confused about the action we're being asked to take for because it doesn't seem to align with 
with so what motion. I would, so what I would say, Ms. Mosley, is that when, when a parent takes that, when they complete that request, that request does kick off saying that they, they want that, child, that review committee to, to review the book. The review committee then has several options they can do, which is um, in the past they could ban the book ultimately and say we shouldn't have this in the schools. They can say in some cases they've said, you know, don't think it should be appropriate for middle school. We need to just move to the high school. Um, or, you know, the, or the other option is that we need to keep this in play. Um, but once at the school level, if they've not been able to pacify a parent for an instructional materials request, then at that point in time, if they complete that form and send it in, that is that request to review the book for those three reasons. Okay, but as part of the review, does that mean one of the options we have is removing it? Because I guess if I were if I were looking at this just straight, strictly on the three choices, if the parent wanted it removed, wanted it withdrawn, as it says, wouldn't they select that? Choice as withdrawn, or I would yes, I would agree with that. I don't, I don't remember which choice was selected, Dr. McDavid. On all four of them, it's just send it to the review committee for reevaluation. So I'm just, I guess, I'm just trying to make sure what we're being asked to vote on. And I think, Ms. Mosley, we can look at that again with um, Mr. Webb and Ms. Webb and I, or we talk briefly about that, that maybe we need to make those choices a little bit more clear and not leave it as ambiguous as just send it to the review committee um, for review. I will say in the past, having run the committee years before Dr. McDavid did in that role, there were times mm -hmm. that parents would just want something with another set of eyes on it from another, from a community, community committee's perspective. And so I think that's probably just left over from those times, but we probably need to be a little bit more specific on that form as to what the action needs to be. Okay. Um, I think I'm fine. Thank you. I, I think kind of in summary, their decision, uh, I believe Dr. McDavid was, it was an appropriate text for the class, grade level, and subject matter. And they did not act to, to direct us to remove it or not to use it at that grade or, or anything else, which is kind of, that, that's sort of in summary what their responsibility be, be remove it, He's good. Uh, use it with the teacher's direction only, uh, or um, or to not use it, it's not an appropriate grade or, or subject matter or subject level. It, it isn't as clear cut as it could be, but uh, you know, some of these things as far as carrying out this policy and the actions, it's been some number of years before one's gone past that committee. So each time, I'm sure we learn a little bit about it. I think there've been two in 16, 17 years I've been here. So each time you learn a little bit more about the process. And what we discovered in this process, we didn't believe, I didn't believe, I think Dr. McDavid or Mr. McCoy or any of the other people that, that heard the summary of this, believed that our process for selecting titles was what it should be. It was not near collaborative enough. It was too much a single teacher in isolation making a decision. The other thing that might be important to remember, and it kind of gets glossed over because there's all kind of information in this, th this is not a current reading list because that teacher doesn't teach this class anymore. So that list went away with her. Now there is a teacher teaching the class <coughs> and they have a list which will be subject to our new procedure when we get that completed. Well, I won't say later this month because the month's about up, but by the end of November. Thank you, Dr. Roystery. Yes, sir. Anyone else, anyone else have a question? Mr. Seddeth. Dr. Royster, I'm looking at policy IFA. It says to provide materials on opposing sides of controversial, controversial issues. I wonder who is supposed to provide those materials. Is the teacher supposed to buy one side or both sides? because the policy says it is to provide materials on opposing sides of controversial issues. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that, so the students may develop under guidance practices of critical reading and thinking. Yes, sir. And you go under, the next one under that says that you want to provide materials that promote respect for human dignity. Yes, I sir. did not find that in those four books. It says appreciation of diversity. I did not find appreciation of diversity in those four books and insight into the values of different cultures. 
Now, as I look at that, it says respect, appreciation, and insight. Sure, uh, not, so I, that's I don't. What I am looking for when we are when we adults can read what they won't do, what they won't. Yes, sir. And I'm not trying to tell adults what to do. I'm simply saying that these are students, and we're supposed to, still supposed to direct these students into what our country is about. And I don't think it's about what is in these four books. End of, the, end of discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Southern. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Mr. Lewis. Just, just one follow-up question. So the, the recommended motion is to uphold the decision of the high school material review committee regarding the appropriateness of the book Dark Money. Yes, that's, that's correct, so sir. If the, if the board votes yes, then that means that the book remains available because this teacher is not teaching this class anymore. So it just means this book exists in the ether as a book that is an option for teachers to put on their reading list at some point in the future. That Should a teacher decide to do so, yes. If the board votes no, then we aren't, we are removing this book as an option for any teacher to put on a reading list. In well, that's future. an interesting question because what he asked is not to remove the book. Mr. Webb? What does, what does a no vote do? I think the form has has some conflicting um, request within it, uh, as far as what the 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 actual request is. I think with the policy and the purpose of the material review committee and the request for it to go to that committee, that committee's primary purpose is to look at instructional material to, to determine if it's appropriate for that student in light of their age. So I, I believe you are correct in the sense that the appeal, the appeal has gone to the material review committee, it's now to the board, and, and the yes vote has that result, no result, no vote has that result. Okay, so a yes vote means, because this teacher's not teaching this class now, a yes vote means this book exists where a teacher could choose this book to put on a list sometime in the future for a class where this might be appropriate. But a no vote would literally remove this book as an option for teachers going forward until this board took some other action. Because of the, the appeal is of the material review committee finding it appropriate for the students. And so the, the no vote would say it is the material review committee was wrong, was incorrect, erroneous and reversing that. Okay, so then my second question would be, board policy allows parents to choose an alternative assignment if they're unhappy with a book that's been assigned to them. So if a parent came to a teacher and said, I don't wanna read the book you've assigned to me, but I want them to read Dark Money, but this board has voted to remove Dark Money as an option, would that parent be able to choose that book or are we prohibiting a future parent from having the same rights that we would want current parents to have? I, my initial reaction, and then that's something that I, we would have to consider, I've never never been asked that question before. Um, I view it as there's a difference between assigning from a teacher versus a parent request for that particular child. So I'm not sure that we would say, as long as it had a literary value and set same academic rigor, that that, that child could not read it. Um, so I, I think that, that that's the difference here. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Hearing none, the motion on the floor is to uphold the decision of the High School Material Review Committee regarding the appropriateness of the book, Dark Money. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed say no. No. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the second book, the Recommended motion is to uphold the decision of the High School Material Review Committee 
regarding the appropriateness of the book, The New Jim Crow. Is there a motion? So moved. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on this book? Any discussion? You have a question or you just want a little? I just wanted a chance to read over because each of these books, the parent has different information. I mean, yes. Yeah, I'm good. Go ahead. Okay. Hearing none, all in favor of the motion is on the floor. Say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The motion carries. The next book, number three, is to uphold the decision of the High School Material Review Committee regarding the appropriateness of the book Nickel and Dined. Is there a motion? So moved. Have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on this third book, The Nickel and Dimed? Miss Leventus Wells. After reading some of the material in this book, I feel like I don't know if this would be exactly high school. Uh, I'm sorry. I can hear you. Uh, I'm not sure this is high school appropriate. And. Um, after reading some of the content in this book, it, it it is very questionable for me. So those are my thoughts. Miss Doolin. Thank you. Are most of the students in these AP literature courses 17 years old? It would vary between 17 and 18 for the most part, junior, seniors. Is there an opportunity for younger gifted students to ever take these AP courses? Um, they would have to be, it, um, trying to do the progression of English courses. It's possible for some of the highly gifted to get into that, possibly. That could be 15 or 16. Possibly. Now, and I will say the teachers do deal with that separately when we have students. We have, we, we have a little challenge with that in, in regards to even some of the uh, CTC kids because they may be at a very, very, very high level post-college, but you have to find, you know, maturity-wise level. So teachers do deal with that separately if they have a very young child that would be appropriate mentally to take the class, but maybe we need to look at it emotionally different. my question because I felt like this book in particular would be very appropriate for someone a young adult in college but absolutely not appropriate for a young high school student and I think that's part of where even year to year teachers do make different decisions I did as an English teacher teacher even in middle school based on maturity level of my kids I had lists of certain books I would do certain years and just depending on maturity level of the kids and sometimes the age of my gifted kids um, how, how old or young they were so I think that's certainly where that discretion and professionalism of the teachers comes in as well to your point thank you thank you Miss Doolin anyone else hearing none all in favor of the motion on book number three say aye aye, aye. all opposed say no no oh. motion carries Next item on the agenda is the fourth book. The recommended motion is to uphold the decision of the High School Materials Review Committee regarding the appropriateness of the book, Talking to Strangers. I need a motion. So moved. I have a motion, is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Ms. Ms. Quinton, Ms. Morrison Ferris, sorry. Uh, any questions or comment on this book? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed say no. no. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is 6.02, South Carolina School Board Association delegates. The recommended motion coming from the committee that hold does not need a second is to certify the slate of delegates with each trustee named as both a delegate and an alternative 
and with the chair assigned three votes and the remaining trustees two votes each. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda, 6.03, revision of board policy, GBO, res resignation and release of contract. The recommended motion from the committee to hold is to approve the revisions to board policy, GBO, coming from the committee does not need a second. Any further discussion? Mr. Mead, yes. can we raise our hands when we're voting? Because I think just a no or yes can, uh, depends on who you hear. You call the question. Yeah, I mean, if you uh, ask for it to be uh, uh, so noted, I'll call the question. Then. I'm going to start. No, don't call the question. Call. No, no, call the question. Call the. Um, uh, I want okay. the votes. Roll call. Roll call. Roll call. Thank you. Thank you. So you want to roll call on this motion? Uh, every one of them from this point. You got to do it each time. I'll do it. Okay, the recommended motion comes to me the code is to approve the revisions of, to board policy GBO. Ms. Bachman, let's call the roll. Ms. Stokes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Got married on me. All right, Mrs. Bush. Hold yeah. just a second. Mr. Suddeth? Yes, it says here on this accompanying administrative rule. I don't have the accompanying administrative rule in front of me. That's, that's right, Mr. Suddeth. Our, our rule will be, though I've begun to draft it and it's largely finalized, it's, it will be based upon the policy as passed, if it, if it does pass. So that will, that will be brought to you and you will be um, provided that in, in the next week or two. So I can approve the policy and disapprove the administrative rule. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that last part, but the rule will be sent to you for your review. Vote yes or no on the policy. I can vote yes or no on the administrative rule. Yes, if you have a concern with the administrative rule, Mr. Sutt, then you can bring that, and and there could be a discussion by the board. Thank you, sir. You don't, you don't vote on the administrative rule. Administrative rule is rule de, uh, developed by the administration. If you have a question about it, you follow up with us on it. You uh, only vote on your on policy, and we only write rule pursuant to a policy you've already enacted. Just reading the, the policy. And, excuse me, Dr. Royster, it says request for lease from employment contracts before the end of the contract term must be considered on an individual basis, must be in compliance with the requirements contained in the accompanying administrative rule. And I would only want to know if I would be <coughs> having access to the administrative rule. Yes, sir. You will, have, you will yes, be sir. sent that administrative rule. Which we, as we do routinely with all administrative rules. Never received an administrative rule. Well, um, Mr. Sud, I, I will talk to you about that. I, I send out emails, but let, I'll make sure that I, that we'll, we'll talk after the meeting. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Sud. Ms. Leventus Wells. I'm going to defer now. Ms. Doolin. Uh, I just have a quick question. Uh, the term maternity has a strike through. Is that now included in health reasons? That is in included or is maternity or maternity reasons just all taken out? That's right. Health, health reasons. Health reasons includes That's maternity. That's okay. Correct. That was my only question. Thank you. Thank you. Any any other questions, comments? Seeing none. Oh yeah, I do see one. Miss Wales. Yeah, just to follow up on what Mr. Suddeth said, if I remember correctly, the way our policy reads about administrative rules is once our Mr. Webb sends us the administrative rule, we review it. If there is a, a concern or a question about the content of it, then a board member can ask that that be put on the committee of the whole agenda so that the administrative rule could be discussed, correct? That is, that is correct. And you can yeah. also contact Dr. Royster or myself. We could also clarify some questions, perhaps, you know, if it's, if it's something simple, relatively straightforward. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wells. Anyone else? Hearing none, Ms. Stokes. Mrs. Bush. Yes. Mrs. Doolin. Yes. Mrs. Goodwin Cowell. Yes. Mrs. Leventis Wells. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. 
Mrs. Morrison Fair? Yes. Mrs. Mosley? Yes. Mr. Sailors? Yes. Dr. Stiles? Yes. Mr. Suddeth? Yes. Mrs. Wells? Yes. Mr. Meek? Yes. 12 yes, zero no. Thank you. Unanimous. The motion is approved. The next item on the agenda is 6.04. If I can get to it. Is innovative course approvals. The recommended motion from the committee to hold does not need a second. Is to approve the proposed local board courses. Any questions or comments? Ms. Wells. Just a follow-up comment because I asked in the committee to hold how many approved courses we had, and you guys told us 550 now innovative courses. So I guess knowing that these come to us every year in that process, are you guys revisiting the innovative courses on any sort of schedule for are these still innovative are these still necessary are they being used so that we're sort of calling out things we do um we do particularly in the honors um we'll you know with the honors rubric particularly those courses that have to meet that state criteria for to be classified as honors so for those particularly we have to go back uh typically a year after they're approved um, just to make sure that the work has been collected um, as required by the State Department in case there's an audit. Um, for the other innovative course, the rest of the innovative courses, given the number, as you stated, we don't review each innovative course, um, just like we don't really on the non-innovative courses, but the schools do, um, you know, they do that review in-house, so to speak, with their, as far as what their students are selecting or not selecting. Um, and of course, if there's something that comes along that would be, could be out, considered out of date, then we would step in from a district level to say, probably don't need to be teaching like keyboarding that we did, you know, when the state changed those requirements that we don't probably need to be offering this anymore. So when you take that course, if you decide there's a course that we don't need to offer anymore, do you guys just take that off? It doesn't really have to come back to the board. You, you just mm -hmm. notify the Department of Education that it's not going to be. We actually don't do have to notify the Department of Education. We just inactivate it in our course, in our power school course catalog, um, okay. and it can be reactivated at some other time, but we don't have to notify the State Department. Um, they look for your approval as far as they only care about your approval to offer it. They don't care about you, about the elimination. And, and that work is, is Dr. McCrary's office involved in sort of auditing what that looks like every on every, some any cycle, or is it just that's really that really falls in my individual specialists. Um, so my social studies specialists who would look at innovative courses for social studies and science and English. So that really falls to them more than um, Dr. McCurry's office. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wells. Ms. Goodwin Caldwell. Jeff, is it still true um, that if your school doesn't offer the course that our students across the district are still able to take advantage of um, of courses that their school does not offer. Yeah, so we are with the this year being the first year of having the same high school schedule across the board. Um, we're getting better at that and putting some process in place. One of the things that really did for us was allow, for example, an AP class at, at a school that may only have three kids that want to take it. Obviously, you can't offer it to that school for three kids, but we could offer it virtually. Um, uh, distance learning wise now that we're on the same schedule to kids across the district um, Riverside okay. High teacher could teach that to multiple kids so yeah so this year was again a little hectic getting all that in place but in the future that's something that we've rolled out the high school principals as an option that we can do okay yes I, I wanted to make sure that all of our kids across the district are able to take advantage of what we offer we'll be able to now with the Thanks, schedules Kim. thank you Ms. Goodwin Caldwell anyone else Hearing none. Roll call. Uh, Ms. Stokes, I forgot your name again real quick. Call the roll, please. Mrs. Bush? Yes. Mrs. Doolin? Yes. Mrs. Goodwin Cowell? Yes. Mrs. Leventis Wells? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. Morrison Fair? Yes. Mrs. Mosley? Yes. Mr. Sailors? Yes. Dr. Stiles? Yes. Mr. Suddeth? Yes. Mrs. Wells? Yes. And Mr. Meek? Yes. Yes, unanimous. Motion carries. Next next item on the agenda is 7.01 committee liaison reports. Any reports? Mr. Lewis. 
Thank you, Mr. Mick. The advocacy committee met yesterday and reviewed uh, the processes that uh, policy positions and resolutions and uh, study reports are adopted by the committee and how those things get to the board. Um, the other thing that we talked about, just so that uh, we can make sure it's here for everybody to hear, is we had planned on having regional meetings with our legislative delegation in November and December. Um, after meeting with the chair of the legislative delegation, uh, he reminded us that December is redistricting this year, and so most of the General Assembly will be spending most of their time that they're available in Columbia working on redrawing maps, and so they recommended that we move to a single meeting in January, and so we have worked with the committee chair of the legislative delegation to schedule January the 10th as a luncheon at Fountain and High School, um, and the entire board will be invited to participate, um, and the entire legislative delegation will be invited. That date, of course, is TBA because it's possible that they may have to go to Columbia on that day too. But for now, if you could just uh, save the date for January the 10th at lunch, which I think is already on the calendar or will be will be soon. What time? Oh, I don't know, lunchtime. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Lunchtime between 11 and 1. Mr. Lewis, is that all? Thank you. Ms. Uh, Levent as well. Um, on November 18th, we have the Hall of Fame dinner where we will um, announce the inductees into the Hall of Fame. You know that many of them have been like the Lieutenant Governor Nick Theodore, uh, Governor Dick Riley. We've had graduates from Greenville High, Wade Hampton, Carolina, everywhere who've been inducted into the Hall of Fame. This is a big event. The tickets are $150 um, a person and the money will go towards scholarships and to also help teacher cadets get involved and, and we really want to try and get these students that are here in our district that will eventually go down the pathway and be our future teachers here in Greenville County. So if you would, um, school what board trustees, again? it's November 18th, it's a Thursday night. And um, like I said, it's $150 per person, or I can't remember, how much is it? It's seven, 75. Oh, I was trying we've, to do 150. We've modified it. Did we May, modify maybe, it? Maybe for two, if you if you bring your, your husband, it's uh, 150. <laughs> I think, I, what, how much is a table, Terry? Um, Sounds like y'all negotiating here. What is it? It was 1100 to sponsor a table for for students and so forth. And then it was, I'm sorry, I thought it was 150. I, I, I might buy two tickets now. <laughs> thank you, thank you Ms. Levent, as well. So everybody thank keep you. that date in mind. It wants to go. Okay. Next item on the agenda is 801 monthly financial report. Robin, do we have anything? No, sir, not this month. Thank you very much. Then that concludes. I need a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chair, I move to adjourn. Second. Well, I ain't got to that oh, yet. Oh, oh. <laughs> we, have a, we have a motion and a second. Are you serious? Are you serious? She missed it. I know all those others. Gonna miss one. Call the roll. Yeah, Debbie Bush said roll call. Shh. Mrs. Bush? Yes. Mrs. Doolin? Yes. Mrs. Goodwin Cowile? Yes. Mrs. Leventis Wells? Definitely yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. Morrison Fair? Yes. Mrs. Mosley? Yes. Mr. Sailors? Yes. Dr. Stiles? Yes. Mr. Suddeth? Yes. Mrs. Wells? Same. <laughs> Abstain. Yes. Abstain. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Meek. No. <laughs> there you go. Okay. You gonna come oh, back and ask me again? Mr. Saylor, sorry. You passed. Uh, I'm, I'm on, yeah, I want to go home, so I'll say yes. Okay. So there's one abstention. Ten yes, one abstention, one no. Motion carries. We're adjourned.